Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this Monday evening. Uh, it's a little bit sunny outside here, so you could be out doing something else, but uh, thank you for joining us here. Uh, we're delighted, uh, the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies, um, to welcome Nicholas Sah, and uh, we're very grateful to Rowan Rushmorgan, our uh, Staff Pride Network Research Officer, uh, who has put a lot of time and effort into organizing uh, a series of research seminars. Um, we aim to uh, engage all uh, university staff and students with uh, academic topics as part of our research seminar series uh, and uh, aim to amplify the voices of underrepresented uh, people. So uh, I'm just going to uh, invite Rowan uh, to say a few words. And thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Uh, Robbie will put uh, uh, ways to get in touch with us on our social media and our YouTube where you'll be able to watch this later uh, and uh, share it with others. And um, oh yeah, there'll be a feedback form. We'd be very grateful for you to let us know uh, how we can improve uh, or just uh, how amazing the uh, everyone involved has been. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. So as Jonathan said, I'm the research officer for the Staff Pride Network. I'm currently doing a PhD at University of Edinburgh. Um, so Nicholas is someone that I met on Twitter. His research sounds very exciting. Um, especially to me as geographer, but also has like quite very interesting implications um, because um, as we know, we, we often focus on UK and North America and it's really important to, to kind of think further afield really. So Nicholas holds an international relations undergraduate degree from the University of the Amazon and he's currently a master's degree candidate at the Federal University of Latin American Integration. And his research interests are LGBT international politics, migration and mobility, queer international relations theory, gender diversity and sexuality studies. So Nicholas will talk a little bit about his master's research and then we'll have the opportunity for questions um, and answer session from, from Nicholas as well. So you can type your questions in the chat, of the Q&A um, section, sorry, as we go. Um, or you can um, put them in um, when we come to the Q&A session at the end. If you've got any problems with sound um, or viewing the screen, just let us know in the chat. So I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas. Um, thanks very much for joining us. It's me, the one who should be thanking you, you all. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And let me pick my notes. <clears throat> Thank you, Robbie. <laughs> and well, so good afternoon, everyone. And as you know, my name is Nicholas, Nicholas Sa. My pronouns are he, him. I identify as a gay cisgender man. Uh, well, in Brazil, when we say, I know it's, there's a, a, a little difference when we say gay here in Brazil and when we say gay in uh, uh, English native countries because um, gays uh, uh, directly to man and lesbian to uh, women but well I identify as a, a gay cisgender man and you can call me Nicholas, Nick, feel, feel free. Um, first of all, I would like to thank very, very much for this opportunity. Um, the University of Edinburgh Staff Pride Network for allowing me to present today's seminar. And thank you, Rowan, for our uh, um, talks. And there's such a unique opportunity to present today's research. I have been working for almost and two years now, and I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on it. Of course, if you're interested to ask, ask me anything. 
And so let's move on to the presentation. Uh, Robbie, thank you. Um, first of all, I felt I needed to locate you in the map. So let's start with it. So here uh, on your left, you have the South America uh, um, map. And I am located at Fosaguasu, which it which translates to English as um, the uh, Iguazu River mouth, which is almost the end of a river, as I know. I'm not a geographer, so Rowan could uh, teach me properly. Uh, but well, uh, I think that that's a good translation, the, the name of the city. And uh, this Brazilian city is, the, is on the triple border. It sits on a triple border region. And on the left, you can see the Paraguayan city of uh, Ciudad del Este, which translates as Eastern city. And on south, you can see Port of Iguazu, which is the Argentinian city of the Triple Border. And well, I think it's important to, to, to say that uh, I will address Foz de Iguazu as Foz only, so just to make you aware uh, how I call it. And so it's important for you to know that Foz in Brazil is the, the city where we have the one of the biggest hydroelectric plants of the world, which is the Itaipu Dam on the north of the city. And Foz is also well known for its uh, um, wonder work, natural, work uh, natural wonder, that is the Iguazu Falls. And well, Brazil shares the falls with Argentina and the hydroelectric plant with Paraguay. So it's a quite uh, important city for Brazil and also uh, to Argentina and Paraguay because it's, uh, it receives many tourists coming from all over the countries and the world as well to visit <laughs> either the, the falls and the the typo then. Um, so that's where I am located in my in the in the world. And uh, first of all, um, no, you can go back. Uh, oh, actually, no, that's good, Robbie. Thank you. Uh, you can go next. Uh, so just you can uh, uh, have an, uh, an idea uh, of the, 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 this border uh, I will show you uh, right now. You can stay there, Robbie, thank you. Um, first of all, I need to say to you that I arrived at Foz de Guasu, at Foz, in July 2019. And I knew absolutely nothing about the city. Actually, I knew it was only part of a triple border region with Paraguay and Argentina. And I knew it was part of, um, and uh, it was the land of the falls and the Taipo Dam. And I also knew I could cross to Paraguay to buy um, a much cheaper uh, prices, uh, all all sorts of electronic goods. But the only thing I did not know when I arrived here was my thesis subject, my master's thesis subject. And everything started uh, with a conversation. It was when I decided to talk about this subject. A friend of mine one told me, once told me that allegedly there was a flow of, and here I will call sexual gender non-conforming individuals, because not all of them identify as LGBT. I, uh, this friend of mine told me that there was this kind of flow of, of uh, refugees 
coming from Paraguay to Brazil to escape prejudice. And as an international relations researcher, I got really curious about this anecdotal evidence. And uh, because, especially because I used to read many articles and books telling me about LGBT refugees around the world, and I thought that uh, it could be happening right before my eyes here in the in these uh, uh, border region. Then I commenced to dive deep, deep into this subject, and I started to read more and more. And I visited both uh, Argentinian and Paraguayan cities. And as you can see in this uh, picture I got for you, um, that's a very important feature I need to tell you first, right, uh, about this border region, is that it's my impression that Brazil and Paraguayan cities they have a more integrated relationship, as you can see in, in this photo. Uh, this is the friend, uh, friendship bridge that connects Brazil to Paraguay. And on the left side, you can see the Paraguayan city, and the right side, we have Brazil. And underneath it, we have the Paraná River. And well, the, the day I visited the, the Paraguayan city, uh, and here I should call CDE, which is the, the, the Spanish acronym for the uh, Eastern city I translated. Um, once uh, the day I visited the city, it was very curious for me that I crossed the bridge. Uh, I walked through the bridge and it lasted, this walking lasted for five minutes, and the, the, the city, the Paraguayan city, it, it, um, it all of a sudden uh, appeared in front of my eyes, and I did not felt like I have changed, I have uh, actually crossed the, 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 the border, uh, it felt like it was all uh, still, I was still in Brazil. And you can go next, Robbie. Otherwise, when I visited um, the Argentinian city, uh, that, that left a, a more curious uh, interpretation for me that um, these both Brazilian and Argentina city were not so uh, integrated as I thought because of my example, my past example, uh, going to Paraguay. When I crossed to Argentina, it, I felt, I really felt I was visiting another country. And the, before you, you cross the Argentinian customs border, you have uh, a fairly long road. And after you cross the, the, the border, you have a longer road until you reach the city center. So, um, um, I, my thoughts about these differences were that, well, once you cross to Paraguay, you can hear people speaking Portuguese and something we call uh, sp Spanish, like uh, it's a mixture. And I could see a uh, 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 little difference when crossing to Argentina, where the, the officers on the custom border uh, talked to me in Spanish, for example. And I had this uh, perspective that of uh, um, not only a physical, but also a subjective uh, border when crossing to Argentina than when I crossed to Paraguay. And that's the reason why I chose 
uh, in my research to look at the Paraguayan side and not to the Argentine. Well, after that, after my, my the visit uh, to both countries and reading about uh, these alleged movement of LGBT, LGBT or sexual and gender non-conforming individuals, I, uh, I started arranging and scheduling interviews and simultaneously I started looking for information and news articles that could give me uh, real proof that um, that was really happening. I wanted to know if that had been documented before this alleged uh, um, flow of individuals. And it, then, it ended up, I did not find any data or piece of information about this movement, this refugee movement. But I did find some uh, news articles disclosing some problems the Paraguayan LGBT community. And here I say LGBT community because I mean the organized LGBT groups that's it for rights. I, I read uh, article, news articles uh, telling me they were facing problems in both uh, CDE, uh, the Paraguayan city, and Hernan Darius, that is a city, a city that is right up the city. And the, the, there were three main events I, I could uh, read in the news articles. First of all, the Hernandira Pride Parade was attacked by pro-family and pro-life uh, uh, groups. And so uh, it happened in 2019, the, the parade people were parading and these, these groups started shooting stones and uh, started literally attacking these people. The second event was the attack of one, actually uh, uh, one councilman. I don't know if, you, if it's a good translation, but it's almost like uh, the person who works in the, uh, city council and legislates and he tried to stop uh, a celebration an LGBT celebration uh, that was happening in CDE in solidarity to those who were attacked in uh, Hernan Darius and the, the the third event was that in 2017 CDE um city council uh, proclaimed uh, uh, the city as pro-life and pro uh, pro family and in 2019 Hernandez did this so both legislatives uh, uh, claimed both cities and separate uh, and distant dates that both cities were pro-life and pro-family. So well, once I found find out about these three events, the the whole picture looked pretty clear for me by the moment that that there was a, a lingering discrimination against LGBT organized groups coming from both uh, society and the local governments. So I linked these characteristics with all, all I had already uh, read about LGBT refuge uh, scholarships in IR, and it uh, allegedly matched all the requirements. So uh, after that, after that I created this scenery, I, and I, uh, un until that point I did not realize that I was biased. I started looking for uh, interviews among pro-LGBT rights groups, just to make me, uh, uh, 
Sure. Uh, is everything good until you're here? Can you, are you understanding it all? Uh, my pronunciation is good. Okay. So are you following the idea? <laughs> So uh, I started looking for interviews among pro-LGBT rights groups. And, um, and my, in the first person, pers in-person conversation, I started realizing things were not like a, a walk in the park. Uh, the first interviewee and the audience who was no bald departing from this first one, showed me that, on the one hand, people were actually resisting discrimination through more uh, formal ways, that is, uh, through activism. And on the other hand, some interviewees uh, that not actually identified as part of the LGBT group, LGBT plus identity uh, group, they would also um, informally resist. Um, this informal resistance, I, I have an example in mind here that I, 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 don't, I did not bring in my slides. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to a lesbian cis woman who uh, lives in Hernan Darius. And she told me that she did not agree with the movement, with the pride parades. Uh, she, did not, she did not agree with people uh, trying to claim their rights. There was these, the way they were trying to, that is uh, trying to claim rights through uh, um, showing themselves in parades and um, screaming and shouting for rights. She thought it, uh, it was negative for the community because that caught too much attention and she did not want that. So she told me that she uh, was um, dating uh, uh, someone and people from her local neighborhood knew she dated a woman, but they did, but according to her, they did not discriminate her nor her partner because they did not show themselves as lesbians. And that is what I understand as this informal uh, resistance, because even though she did not agree with the former resistance, she showed her identity to the community. When people uh, uh, arrived to talk to her uh, in, in her neighborhood, and she told me one example that once uh, uh, a father approached her with her girlfriend, with his son, and told his son that she, uh, she dated a girl. And she, she said she felt uncomfortable with that uh, exposure, but she, well, confirmed she was a lesbian. So that's what I characterize as a form informal resistance. Um, <clears throat> so, I also looked for Paraguayans live in Foz de Guasú, in Foz, just to make sure I was not exactly uh, uh, wrong with my initial idea, but I could not find these people here. At least I did not find Paraguay individuals living here in, in, in this specific city. Under the circumstances of living the country, their country, fleeing from uh, discrimination and persecution. Of course, there are Paraguayans living here, but, but it's because of the this integration between both uh, cities. Uh, but what I did find uh, is that spawned from the first interview and kept repeating itself uh, and, and kept repeating actually in many other interviews was the use of the border and what I understand now borrowing from geography his scholarship is a pendulum-like mobility 
So many interviewees would cross, uh, just to explain this, this idea, uh, many interviewees would cross the border for shopping and especially at uh, uh, Brazilian grocery stores. Uh, Paraguayans would come here to buy uh, stuff and uh, um, food in lower prices and also for leisure. And um, actually, that's a, a common feature when we have uh, twin cities, that interconnectedness is very common, actually. And um, what I could uh, understand from this uh, pendulum mobility is that uh, talking to Brazilians and Paraguayans, I could understand that Actually, Paraguayans, uh, LGBT Paraguayans come to Brazil more than Brazilians go to Paraguay. LGBT Brazilians go to Paraguay. And, uh, well, what caught me, uh, what caught my attention, what actually called my attention in this, uh, um, this feature was that the border proximity uh, was uh, useful, particularly for sexual and gender non-conforming Paraguayan individuals. Some interviewees told me uh, they used to cross from Paraguay to Brazil to visit or to attend LGBT-friendly bars and other sorts of gatherings. Since in, since in CDE, there was no such place as LGBT bars, specifically LGBT bars. A couple of Paraguayans individuals um, told me that they used, actually, there used to be uh, LGBT bars uh, in at CDE, but they shut its doors because it lacked, lacked customers in the sense that few people were willing to be seen there at that LGBT place. Uh, so even LGBT Paraguayans uh, did not want to go to these uh, LGBT bars in Paraguay. Um, people told me in interviews actually that these bars were mostly um, visited and used as uh, drag queens, uh, how can I say that, um, places for drag queens to put on a show. Um, so, moving on in my, in my research, I realized that for sexual and gender non-confirming individuals, this border meant something else more than just, uh, um, well, I, I, I was born here in a triple border, so I have another country, and actually had two countries. No, it meant more, uh, especially for these sexual and gender non-conforming individuals. It was actually uh, one way these individuals could express their sexualities and gender diversities. There's a particular case of a trans woman I interviewed, and at this point, you can go next slide, Robbie. Thank you, please. <clears throat> so, um, okay. Um, there's a particular case of this transgender woman I interviewed who said she used to um, offer prostitution services here in Brazilian, here in the Brazilian border. And she was the same woman who, after I asked her in, in our conversation, um, if she uh, ever wanted to come to Brazil to, uh, um, escape discrimination, and at the at the point of 
the the interview that was one of my first interviews actually uh, I was still looking for this refugee hypothesis. So I asked her if she ever wanted to cross to Brazil to live here free of uh, uh, discrimination. And she answered me, uh, no, I don't want to, to, to go to Brazil for anything. I'm more afraid of Brazil than Paraguay. Brazil is the country with the most transgender homicides in the world. The idea of a transgender being able to live freely in Brazil cannot be conceived. She will live in fear. It's impossible. The statistics speak for themselves. And well, after she said that, I felt like I was... Uh, um, uh, that struck me really hard, you know? And that helped me to deconstruct all this uh, periculous idea that the Paraguayan society was uh, allegedly um, uh, qualified as. So uh, at this moment, uh, after this interview, I realized how biased my, my standpoint was. And well, this I'll explain better later, but uh, I can in, adv in advance tell you that I was also impregnated uh, uh, with these uh, uh, imagination that Brazil was a more developed country than Paraguay because it was sexually and gender diverse. It was more sexually and gender diverse than Paraguay. And well, uh, I can move on. Um, I also noted that the, the way these Paraguayan and also Brazilian individuals uh, narrated their movements at the border area presented what I assumed as an intrinsically modern discourse. Uh, I borrow this, uh, this one of uh, uh, hot discussions in II scholarship. And I started to realize that these interviewees, they, in their border crossings, they would bring with themselves these, these uh, uh, discourses that seem to me much connected to the um, modern, political modernity idea. So um, now I would like to explain this, this better for you. Uh, in, in many cases, um, Paraguayans and also Brazilians in, um, talked about Paraguay exactly in the way I just told you, as being underdeveloped comparing to Brazil, considering the acceptance towards sexual and gender non-conforming individuals. Um, I think you can go next, Robbie, please. So, <clears throat> this was the case of my first interview this interviewee, uh, a, a gay uh, cis man, an activist, he, he, in the middle of our conversation, he told me that he visited Rio de Janeiro and he, he uh, in a particular point in our conversation, he told me that uh, I was there, I was in there, Rio. Uh, alone, no one looked at me. I walked naked in the street, not naked, right, but in swim trunks, uh, practically naked, almost naked. Nobody looked at me and there I'm free, you know. And here in Paraguay, you are wearing clothes like this and everyone keeps looking at you. Imagine if you wear swim trunks. And another part of the, our interviews are of this interview, he said, in Brazil, you have specific LGBT places. 
there are even LGBT neighborhoods, there are LGBT beaches, so it's a safer place. This was uh, this Paraguayan uh, individual telling me, uh, and this was the first contact I had with this discourse of development coming from an, an interviewee. Um, but um, it's curious that, for instance, Paraguayans stated this Brazilian superiority, citing uh, a couple of times, citing anti-homophobia laws we have here. Instead, for Brazilians, uh, the interviewees uh, brought up the socio-Paraguayan machismo, that is the patriarchal and heterosis normativity embedded in that society. So uh, on the one hand, we had Paraguayans saying that, well, Brazil is good for us because, uh, not good, but uh, it's better for us because they there you have laws. And if we go take a look in our uh, uh, anti-homophobia laws, actually, here in Foz, since 2002, we have uh, uh, this specific law, who was withdrew, who, which was withdrawn when in 2018, the Superior Court uh, uh, yes, in 2018, the Superior Court of Brazil uh, created actually not created, but uh, here in Brazil, we have the racism, uh, anti-racism law, and the Superior Court uh, made uh, um, the anti-homophobia law equal to the anti-racism anti law here in Brazil. So on the one hand, we have Paraguayans saying that Brazil is uh, superior to Paraguay because of its laws. And on the other hand, we have Brazilians saying that uh, Paraguay is not that good for people because um, they are uh, uh, culturally patriarchy. Uh, there is a cultural patriarchy and heterosis normativity. You can go to the next slide, please, Robbie. <clears throat> So this is one example of another interview with a Brazilian CS gay man. He said to me that homosexuals in Paraguay, I see, I see that they have less, less acceptance than in Brazil. They have less freedom to be gay in Paraguay than we still have here in Brazil. I think Paraguay is a little late in this regard. And you know, uh, what is what was really um curious for me um i lost myself just one second in my notes okay so what i i found really curious for me was that what either brazilians or paraguayans did not dismiss that brazil that the brazilian uh, uh, society was also patriarchal and heteronormative. Um, on the contrary, they they confirmed this aspect. However, they assumed that in Brazil things would still be better than in Paraguay. So this this course was very uh, present in almost all interviews. And well, as I told you, and that's uh, uh, a real statistic here in Brazil, Brazil is one of the most, uh, uh, it's the country with the most numbers of LGBT harm sites in the world. So me as a Brazilian gay man, knowing this reality, how can I agree with this assumption that Brazil is better than Paraguay? Wouldn't it be the same thing? So, well, I started asking me this. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, 
<clears throat> so there's uh, this Brazilian uh, gay man um, who used to study uh, in Paraguay. He was a medical student in Paraguay. He, when I asked him about uh, his uh, um, his experience living in Paraguay for his studies, uh, he told me that uh, for an LGBT person, because of the lack of acceptance, uh, in addition to like, it's more, you know, less developed country. So it would be harder to be an LGBT person in Paraguay. Uh, so, since it's a less developed country. It's more difficult to live there. So when he was there, it was like really hard, like really, really hard. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, another part of her conversation, he stated that uh, he thought that there was a lot of difference between both countries. He thought that in Brazil, it was much easier for you to say that you are like gay and you can be more relaxed here than in Paraguay. And for him in Paraguay, people take it more seriously. They are very religious. So for example, several boss, boys I met did not come out, did not come out of the closet because of this reality. Uh, he stated that um, quoting the guys, the, the boys, oh no, my parents are very religious, they don't like it very much, they have to be, uh, uh, they, it's more like they, the, the boys have to be the, the, the male figure of the family, so they cannot uh, disclose their sexuality. Uh, <clears throat> you can go to the next slide, please, Robbie. Okay, no, you can. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you can, can go back, please. It's not, not the end. Uh, so, um, now, uh, I would like to, after I exposed these mobility and these, um, this modern discussed feature and in, in the interviews, I'd like now to move directly to the discussion I propose in my um, thesis research. And as an, uh, as an uh, IR academic, I am very fond of discussions about human mobility, be it forced or not, forced mobility or not. And in this case, I had, the, I had these international border crossings of sexual gen and gender non-conforming Paraguayans and Brazilians to elaborate my discussion. Uh, some interviews revealed that, uh, as I told you, some Paraguayans, sexual and gender non-conforming individuals, used to come to Brazil to go to gay-friendly bars or other gatherings. And um that is the 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 case of mobility I have for my thesis. And furthermore, I am also interested in inside my IR academic scholarship about LGBT and sexual and gender, gender diversity in international politics that is, uh, I'm interested to understand how um, the subject is transferred and mobilized in international politics. And in this case, I found a very um, striking and concerning discourse that is close to the idea of an Western LGBT modernity that preaches development and that development is only, uh, you can only reach development only you once you accept gender and sexual diversity. 
otherwise you will lag behind will you will stay uh, uh, on a lower ground in this hierarchical uh, international ladder then uh, put that after uh, clearing these uh, subjects in my thesis, I started interrogating myself. How does this discourse relate to this border region? That is to the border itself. Since there is a, a I started thinking about that because I understood there was high level of integration between both cities, both Paraguayan and Brazilian cities. And in OIA, International Relations Scholarship, there are loads of discussions and uh, papers uh, about border politics. That's why I chose to also look at this issue. I, I look at that and started to question how these individuals enacted the the this borderization with their discourses but also subverted the same border logic with their crossings so uh, let me explain it better um on the one on the one hand i have these individuals this integration between both cities and this integration it uh, blurs this border as i told you the the first time i went to the paraguayan city i could not visualize the the border the this crossing this difference this uh severing uh, limit that a border should represent however at the same time, I could understand I was in another country since I, since the, the, the Brazilian and the Paraguayan states were there in the bridge with their uh, uh, customs border and officials. But uh, unlike the Argentinian example, um, the supervision of these officers uh, it's not very uh, um, harsh to to authorize people to let in and out of both countries. So it's much more symbiotic. Um, on the other side, uh, Argentina, no, you, you must present your ID, your Brazilian ID. You must tell you tell them what you're going to do in the country, and well. That reminds me a lot when I visited the UK and I was really terrified when the the officer uh, asked me in a very harsh tone, uh, what you're doing here? What you want to do here? Why are you coming here? And I felt like, well, I am crossing a border here, I think. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I got lost my, my thoughts. Okay, so if in the one side we have this uh, uh, issue, people, uh, this border crossings calls to the, uh, uh, to this uh, imagination of a border. On the other side, we have, uh, on the other hand, we have the, the discourse to ensure that this border really exists. And it's not only a, a physical border, it's a subjective border. So I, I, my, my research question, uh, I started to, to form it as, what, the, what is the modern logic of uh, uh, superior move, develop, development in the alleged Brazilian sexual and gender diversity acceptance discourse in comparison to Paraguay. Uh, 
uh, uh, what it's presented and how is it presented by sexual and gender non-conforming individuals on both sides of the Brazilian Paraguay border? And what does their pendulum mobility uh, represent to this stabilization and subversion of these uh, very same border logic? And as my hypothesis to this uh, question, uh, I say that whereas the pendulum mobility of these individuals uh, challenges and blurs the, the established limits of the statist logic of borders, these same individuals, they, um, they propel a discourse of modernity based on development through the idea of sexual and gender diversity that places Brazil in a superior position compared to Paraguay. And that creates a fictive hierarchy that advance conflicting uh, images between uh, the reality and the idealization that, sex that these individuals uh, how these individuals actually live in both countries. So this, um, this movement, this mobilization, this discourse mobilization creates these images uh, that uh, do not correspond well to the reality these uh, LGBT uh, individuals live both in Brazil and Paraguay. But um, ultimately, this discourse, it serves the stabilization of the borders and it stabilizes the statist, lo statist logic. That is one of the, the most important assets for the, for the, the reproduction of the state, actually. So, in other words, uh, once the belief uh, that Brazil is seen as a superior country, because it place, uh, uh, it's a place where diversities are accepted, uh, and thus it represents a modern country, Paraguay is placed on the opposite side of this hierarchy as lagging behind and primitive, since it does not follow the same progressive patterns uh, of development. And it's part of my argument in my, in my thesis that this modern discourse not only strengthens the formal uh, polit political segre uh, segregation and uh, that divides both countries, uh, it creates a, a subjective border that segregate, segregates people from uh, their subjective understandings. So, um, I think that's all I have to tell you about my presentation in this seminar. But before finishing, I would like to uh, talk uh, about the, the more uh, academic feature of these, um, this research concerning the, uh, my, my methods and my methodology. I actually, it's not very common for Brazilian or yeah, scholars to write their thesis or their dissertations or articles in the first person. Here in Brazil, we actually, uh, uh, most people uh, find it very unobjective uh, and find it not so scientific as it should be. And however, in my case, I decided to write it in the first, in the first person because I inspired myself in ethnographical studies. 
And in IR international and in the international scene of IR scholarship, there are discussions about ethnography being transplanted to international relations. There are many discussions saying that IR uh, uh, academics do not understand the full uh, um, the full importance of ethnography. So I decided to say that I inspired myself in this method and methodology. So um, through my writing, I intend to not only show that um, scientific writing can be done in, in the first person, but show that in Brazil, um, there is much of this colonial uh, 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 imaginary that puts us in um, in the lower the lower ground compared to let's say uh, global north. So um, while I was preparing my presentation for today's uh, seminar, I started to realize that it's actually a, a kind of subject subjective hierarchy, because we have uh, in, in, uh, locally, we have Paraguay that is inferior to Brazil, and we have Brazil that, that is allegedly inferior to Europe, or United States, or Australia, or, well, and through my writing, I intend also to address this discussion of these uh, um, subjectivity of uh, uh, inferiority that most people in global south um, believe. And well, just to finish, you can go to the last slide, Robbie, please. Just to finish my, my participation, oh, not my participation, but my, my talk here. Um, It means a lot for me, not only as an academic uh, from Brazil, but as a. But it means a lot for me for a person, and located, in the global in, in the south, global south, because, um, as you, uh, Rowan and Jonathan were telling, uh, I th I, actually I think it was Jonathan, <laughs> who. Uh, talked in the beginning. Um, it's important to address this issue that we face here, uh, being an academic from the uh, global south, that we live in underdeveloped countries, third world countries, and it's really hard for us to have this access to what has been produced in academic uh, fields in the world and the economic uh, part of this it's also important because here in brazil uh, since 2018 we have been facing many problems due to the scenarios and the 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 current government has attacked very hard our education system and this adds to the the problem of our financial support here we have for um, the scientific area in brazil so this space this opportunity i thank you very very much for this and this is extremely important to be here um even though i'm a, a gay cis white guy actually uh <laughs> white for the brazilian pardon for the Brazilian perspective, I'm white, but um, it, it's important for for us to to be here, especially since I come from a, a low income country and a low income um, university, which is a, a federal university, but it also suffers from uh, from the, the depleting economic scenario we live here in Brazil. So after these um, 
today's presentation. Um, I'm, a, a, I'm a bit embarrassing right now, but okay. So to finish, do you have questions? Do you have suggestions? What are your thoughts? <laughs> and I misspelled thoughts. <laughs> I'm all in. Uh, this is my email if you want to talk to me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I look very much forward to hear your considerations and your questions. If you feel you have questions to ask me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was incredibly interesting and I feel like I've had like a little window into a different part of the world from this window in Edinburgh and um, from where everyone else is at the moment. Um, just to say you can put questions in the Q&A tab or you can also raise your hand and I think I have the power to allow people to speak as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions it would be great if you put them in. Um, and yeah, Nicholas, if you could type your email in the chat, um, that would be okay. Sure, in a minute. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll start with a question if that's all right, Nicholas. Um, okay. So it was, it was really interesting to see your hypothesis change kind of throughout your research because we don't often see that. Um, we often see kind of the polished and productive um, kind of forgetting that there's all that thought beforehand and I was just I was wondering if you where you felt because you said you, you felt like you were a little bit biased like where you felt that bias comes from whether it's from like an academic perspective or a personal perspective um, and kind of a second part to that was there much academic literature already around um, kind of LGBT um, Buddhists relating to kind of refugees in international relations. Sorry, that's two parts. <laughs> so um, starting from the beginning, uh, that's exactly uh, where my, my bias position came from, from my academic perspective, and also uh, a little bit of vanity of me because I was, uh, I believed that I was facing a, uh, a problem. I used to read my, uh, ac my academic papers, uh, studies and uh, books. And I thought, well, if it's really happening here and no one has uh, um, addressed this issue, what's happening? So uh, that was, uh, partly because of my uh, academic uh, uh, background and also because of my academic vanity, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> and sorry for the second part, you wanted to know I... I, I was if there's much literature already available about, and you can advance that a little bit, so, relations with LGBT people. Yeah, uh, most of the, the literature we have available in international relations uh, started um, very, very late actually, started raising this problem around the 90s. Uh, actually, when, when it was when the queer theory started more to be more famous around the, the disciplines, but especially, specifically international relations uh, scholarship, uh, since 2000, 15 around that uh, we have Cynthia Weber which is a professor at the University of Sussex yes and she is a very important uh, queer um, international queer academic uh, because she in 2016 she wrote a book about titled queer international relations and she addresses many issues but they the main problem we have uh, presented in international relations papers and discussions uh, is concern is concerns to the LGBT refuge and uh, and also there are literature on transgender, uh, migrants and transgender uh, 
transgender border crossing individuals, I think that's what they call it. But well, my expertise is more um, towards these refuge and mobility. Um, actually, turn to the mobility because of my uh, current uh, uh, subject, but uh, I used to study more um, LGBT refuge. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a question from Zara, and I don't know if you can, are you able to see the q and Nicholas? Um, so it says, really interesting talk. Are there any ways for us outside of Brazil slash Paraguay to best support the, the activism and ongoing struggle to improve life for LGBT plus people there? So, Sarah, thank you very much for your question. Um, well, that is actually an ethical issue I have been um, thinking about, but just to uh, make you feel more, I don't know, relieved about the situation. Um, here in CDE, specifically in CDE in Paraguay, the International Amnesty is working with them, so they have the, their support. So I think that for for these um, for this support, you maybe can be in touch with the uh, Amnesty International or International Amnesty. <laughs> uh, well, you you got it. So uh, for this part, you maybe can um, get in touch with them. And, and support their events, their um, LGBT uh, gatherings, uh, because they, well, as I said, uh, in 2019, the, their Pride Parade was attacked. And well, maybe that's uh, uh, a way to support them. And the ethical problem I was talking about is actually concerns to my academic positioning and all these uh, issue. Uh, once I got to the fieldwork, I felt very um, like I was using their information without actually helping them, but. Um, but then I, I started reading many, many, many papers, many pieces of people who, who talked about these uh, uh, ethical problem, especially in anthropology. And well, I started to take easier on me when I realized that this was an issue that was not being taken serious here in, the, in this border region. And once my research is finished, I intend to, uh, in retribution to these individuals, to um, transform my, my thesis into a podcast series uh, in Portuguese. And because I'm actually writing it in English, that's another problem. That's another issue that I have been colonized by the academia. <laughs> but well, I intend to to take my um, thesis once it's done to the to a podcast series, so more people can hear it. And also, it's not like my. 60, 65 years old father is going to search my thesis into no maybe he will but well it's not my like it's not like my 16 my 60 years old uncle is going to do, to my university's website to look for my well I look for uh, a thesis on this subject let me search for it so it's I think it's more uh, uh, it's more it's easier for someone to see my thesis explained of course, not academically uh, um, available, but uh, uh, like a, a real normal person talking to them in a podcast series. So I found that it would be, um, it would ease this issue uh, on the, on the, on, 
Oh my gosh. In on the one hand, because um well, I don't know how uh, what other would what would be the other ways I could help these individuals other than giving them uh, these um, making people aware of this situation. I think positionality is always going to be such a difficult um, area of theory to get through whilst doing your research and then disseminating but if, if you do make that podcast we'd love a, a link to that as well. Um, so there's a question from Anna um, and they say thank you for your talk interested in the difference between individual feelings, the importance of being free to be out and visible, the availability of LGBT businesses with wider quantitative data. So Anna's from Mexico, um, where they have a similar situation. It's seen as a liberal place, um, but also there's high levels of violence. Um, and do you have any information or thoughts about kind of paradox between um, the liberal place versus it being quite violent? Okay, Anna, thank you for your question, Anna. Um, <clears throat> just let me read the beginning again. Um, so um, that's a good good point, Anna. I think I can um, bring this to my <laughs> to my thesis because I actually do not have this data uh, until now until the until today i have uh collected 16 conversations with with 16 different people <laughs> but um that would be so so interesting for me to cross these quantitative data with these uh, um uh with the the data i caught it guarded with the the uh the interviews and the you're from mexico hello so uh, uh concerning this part um i think this scenario of uh, well the, the paradox scenario as you say here that's a really good interpretation it's very common all over the world i would say because um what i understand is that the modernity this course wants to make uh, people believe that um, developed countries they do not face these problems and maybe they may have uh, laws about these problems but how actually how how does how these laws actually help in, in a more qualitative uh perspective you know what i mean uh how a law anti-homophobia law helps to explain to these um older individuals who live in a small city in i don't know wales <laughs> uh to understand that they should not propel homophobic uh, um discourses they should not discriminate these individuals and so this discourse wants to mobilize these uh this modern discourse i mean wants to mobilize these uh, uh features of sexual acceptance as patterns as uh, uh a pattern to for those countries the underdeveloped countries to follow and um well that's it uh i think that's it <laughs> for this question but i would really like to uh anna if you have any references i would love to to read more about this mexican situation um i've been really interested about that um uh, about these uh, to know if this same uh, uh, discrimination and configuration of of uh, prejudice happens in other border cities and other twin cities 
uh, around the world, not only here in Brazil, Paraguay, or only in South America. Uh, for instance, I'd really like to know if uh, it's because I'm not an expert in Europe, but I do think that in Europe, uh, there are cities uh, that, there are twin cities bef uh, between two countries. And I would really like to make a comparative study about that because, well, if we say, for instance, we have Spain and France, and they are very developed countries, they are in Europe, they are the pinnacle of development. Does this happen? Or how does it happen? How this feat does this uh, movement happens, if it happens, actually? So thank you for your question again, again Emma. <laughs> thank you, Anna. That is a really interesting um, point to make. I think kind of just leading on from that question, what seemed very um, distinct was uh, the participant that you had as a trans woman who was stating the statistic about um, trans women experiencing the highest levels of homicide in Brazil. Um, was, did you find in your participants there was a difference in attitudes between trans people um, and cis people um, kind of towards how safe they felt in either Paraguay or Brazil? Well, the safety um, feeling is... Okay, so I have interviewed two transgender, transgender, trans, transgender women, <laughs> one from Paraguay and the other Brazilian, and both stated uh, an unease feeling uh, towards the border crossing, uh, the Brazilian uh, transgender woman told me that she did not feel safe going to Paraguay due to the, because she was concerned uh, of harassment in the streets, and uh, she, she stated that uh, she saw Paraguayan society as uh, too heteropatriarchal and they, the men were too much uh, macho and uh, the, the Paraguayan transgender woman, she, well, as I told you, she did not want to uh, uh, come to Brazil. And to answer your question, Rowan, that's very interesting that cis people, they, uh, in my interviews, they did not actually, um, they were not actually concerned to these uh, specific marker, uh, gender marker, you know, uh, they they told me much more about their uh, experiences. So I have interviewed uh, um, gay men, lesbians, uh, transgender women, but I could not find uh, people identifying as bisexual or. Uh, transgender men, or, well, I was going to say queer, but that's not a very uh, a common uh, identity here in South America. Um, but, well, that's it. Uh, th those cisgender people, they did not actually um, show their thoughts on these issue. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Quite. What I'm thinking about that is, um, I was I was just thinking kind of how useful then is it to be using terms that we use in the West, like LGBT um, in international relations, then to define a population that doesn't feel like a community with them themselves. Is that something that kind of bothers you? That's that's so that, that's really curious, you know, because if I go to um, let's say, uh, the, the UK, we, or if I go to Chile or Nicaragua, um, and I find, I will surely find LGBT rights groups, pro-LGBT rights groups, you know, and we, it's like we share this same identity, even though they, uh, we have the regional differences of, um, translation but um it's 
also common if I go to these uh, countries that I will find people that they that people that are for instance men who date a man or who has sex with same gender individuals they will not feel part of these uh these uh shared feeling of identity of uh, the shared identity but um in this case as i told you that is much more curious is that they if you look uh, in the first look you will tell that they are going against their own rights but they do not feel like they have these rights uh, as i told you the case of this uh, lesbian woman uh, that well uh, is ashamed of uh, telling to all the people about her sexuality and well you know it's much more connected to these um, uh how can i name it this logic eligibility logic international eligibility log logic that we are all part of the same community when well we first need to ask people if they feel they are part of this community <laughs> i don't know if i answered you or yeah, I don't... Yeah, sorry <laughs> okay no that's that is um it's very interesting because we have similar discussions in the UK as well as to kind of what whether LGBT means a specific set of people in a specific community if um, not everybody feels part of that. Exactly. Um, we've got about four minutes left, so if anyone has any questions that they want to put in the Q&A or raise their hand, um, you're very welcome to. Um, I guess uh, from Sorry, is that a question? Or no, you just <laughs> wanted to. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I would I would like to to talk for these uh, last minutes to just advance my um, my PhD research. Actually, the PhD research uh, research design I want to to study in the next year and because I, I forgot to put this in my slides and I think it's uh, um, it's really good to point where I'm going after these discussion right and and I actually come from the north of Brazil and I don't know if most of you know but the north of Brazil is where the um, Amazonia is the forest is and I for my doctoral studies, I would like to keep on the same track of uh, discourse uh, uh, analysis and talk specifically about indigenous um, sexualities here uh, in the Brazilian uh, Amazonia. So um, just <laughs> for you know, just so you know that I am uh, I keep on this uh, same track for my my research because after all I like to talk about gays and lesbians and world politics and trans people and that's talks much more about me than uh, other other interests that it could be. Uh, featured in my in my research questions because I identify as a gay man and I'd like to know how is it that my subjectivity uh, uh, means what it means to world politics and also to our internal politics so that's it oh the best of luck for your PhD um as it as it comes about please do keep in touch because we'd really love to hear um about that as it unfolds <laughs> So I think we can wrap up now, just to say if you're able to, um, anyone who's attending, if you're able to um, give us some feedback about this event, that would be really great. And Robbie's also put the links to follow us on Twitter and the platforms. And um, thank you so much, Nicholas, for, for coming along and talking about your research. It's been really lovely to, to chat to you virtually and, and 
doing this on Zoom means that we can we can talk to more people in lots of different places. And, and thank you for everyone who is um, attending this evening slash afternoon wherever you are. And um, I think that's that's all from us. Thank, thank you so much. You.